it's kind of like if the movie is all the president's men and the Iron Lady had a baby and that movie baby wanted to be an award circuit juggernaut when it grew up. That's right, today we're talking about the 2017 Meryl Streep Tom Hanks tandem vehicle, The Post. This is a biopic written by Liz Hanna and Josh Singer and directed by Steven Spielberg and it's rated PG-13 for language and brief war violence. So the first category in my grid is going to be genre. And for me, genre was the weakest area of the post. Now, biopics are a particularly difficult genre because for the most part, audiences already know how the movie's going to end, or at least they have a general idea of what's going to happen throughout the movie. Now, usually a biopic will either teach the audience something new about events they're already familiar with, or they'll give a new perspective on history. And the post really didn't do either of these things. The historical account throughout the movie felt very basic and watered down, and the characters were fairly flat. Now, the dialogue was excellent and very well delivered by every character throughout the movie, but it was really just a bunch of monologues served to rile up the audience based on the comparisons between what was happening then and what is happening now. And to be fair, it worked. There were several times within the theater that I was in where the audience just erupted into cheers and, you know, applauded and, you know, really seemed to get into it. But all the monologues were just so blatantly and transparently applicable to today that I kind of found myself rolling my eyes throughout the movie, which is not great. The lack of subtlety and just the the hitting you over the head with the comparisons, um, it's just going to make it so that it doesn't stand the test of time. You know, people are going to look back on this movie in, you know, even just a couple of years probably, and it's not going to have that same effect. It's not going to, you know, people aren't going to be cheering when they look back and watch this movie. And it's not a bad thing to have a movie that, that takes a historical account and, you know, makes it applicable to the present. Movies have been doing that since at least, you know, Battleship Potemkin in 1925. Like, this is not... This is not new and it can be done very effectively, but I think you really have two options when you're going to go that route with a movie. Uh, the first is to have subtlety and nuance and, you know, have people have to, you know, really reach and think about it and see the comparisons and think for themselves to connect those dots, um, which the post did not do. There are no dots to connect. It's just a straight line. No subtlety, no mystery, no, I wonder what the author's intent is. None of that, which isn't necessarily a bad thing either, uh, because the other option is to be very straightforward and, and make it very obvious, the comparison, and then have some sort of call to action. And, and I really didn't feel like the post had that either. I mean, it definitely had the moral of the story, so to speak, of, you know, freedom of the press and don't let the government tell you what you can print in the press. And that's definitely applicable to today. It didn't really have any kind of call to action. You know, it was just a comparison of here's what happened then, here's what happened now. So I, so I really felt like, you know, within the genre, um, if they wanted to make a movie that was powerful and had a strong message, but is also something that people can look back on and, and still feel that power, um, they, they miss the mark. Within a couple of years, this movie is going to be lost. So for genre, I gave The Post a 4 out of 10, which is going to be a C-, minus. so still below average, but not quite failing. You know, it is what it is. So the next category in the grid is going to be writing. And with the writing, I really felt like this movie could have been more powerful if they focused on characters. Like I was saying, with genre, you know, they have the two options, be subtle or have a call to action. Um, I really think that the best option for this movie would have been to, to make the comparisons to the present a little bit more subtle, but have the, the main focus be Meryl Streep and Tom Hanks and their, you know, their characters and their struggles and why they make these decisions that they do and what it means you know, not just to America, but to them as Americans. And I really think that, that that was a missed opportunity. I also thought that The Post did a decent job of having both, you know, internal struggles and external needs, particularly for Meryl Streep's character. You know, externally, she wanted to keep The Washington Post afloat, and internally, she kind of wanted to you know, prove to herself and to her readers that she, you know, could keep it afloat. Um, but the fact that those two goals are so closely connected, combined with the fact that her actions don't do a particularly good job of reflecting either the struggle or the goal, I mean, it's really 
everything is expressed through monologues. And it's just, uh, it just kind of felt lazy on behalf of the writers. I mean, the, the plot was decent and the monologues were very, very well written. Like, the, the quality of writing is good. I'm, I don't want to uh, insult anybody. I just wish that, um, you know, the focus had been on the characters rather than, you know, relying on the cast to deliver monologues, particularly because you had such talented actors and, you know, yes, they're capable of delivering these great monologues, but they're also capable of just giving very emotional performances that can reflect these internal struggles that go along with these external goals and just all of that was just lost in a sea of monologues and it's just... It's just unfortunate. So even though it was a very well-written script, uh, it just had just a lack of, of emotional depth for me. And it just, um, there were just a lot of missed opportunities when it comes to storytelling. So the writing overall fared a little bit better than the genre. I gave it a 5.6 out of 10, which is going to be a C+. The next category in the grid is going to be editing and special effects. Overall, I thought the post was very well edited. Uh, my biggest gripe, though, is gonna come with the pacing. There were several scenes throughout the movie that could have been cut way down, um, particularly when it comes to the scenes that were trying to build anticipation and suspense. I'll go into more detail with this aspect when I get to the directing and cinematography category, because I do think that a lot of that was, was very intentional um, within the directing as opposed to the editing, um, but just the, the way some of the scenes were cut together. The scene that stuck out the most to me was the one where Meryl Streep is on the phone and she's trying to decide if she should publish the article about the papers or not. And everybody knows how that scene is going to end. Not only is this movie based on true events in which these articles were published, but there also, there wouldn't be a movie if halfway through she decides, no, nah, let's play it safe, we're not going to publish there wouldn't be a movie. And that was one of the scenes where the audience cheered, so I'm maybe alone in this, but it just, it just irritated me more than anything. And that scene could have been cut way, way, way down. And I'll talk more about that scene when I get to the directing and the cinematography section, because I do think a lot of my irritation came with the way it was shot rather than the way it was edited. But the editing also contributed very much so to the, you know, that feeling of drawing it out and, you know, expanding the anticipation. It was just unnecessary and just irritating. And there were a few other scenes that did that as well. So the total score for the editing and special effects is going to be a 7.2 out of 10, which I consider to be a solid B. The next category in the grid is going to be the sound design. Um, the score is one of the areas of the movie that is getting some buzz. Um, and I thought it was fine. I, you know, I really didn't think it was, um, you know, the best score I've heard all year. But it wasn't bad by any means. It was fine. It was it was a good score. Um, you know, it's John Williams. You really can't go wrong with a John Williams score. Um, so yeah, the score was fine. My biggest complaint within the sound design is going to come in the opening scene where we're in Vietnam. And I just felt like the sound mix there was really um, flat. You know, first off, when that big explosion goes off and um, kind of starts the combat, it's it was very predictable. You know, I was waiting for about 30 seconds before it happens to be like, all right, and explosion. But, you know, it's coming. When is it going to come? And then it came and it didn't really seem that loud. It was like I was waiting for that kind of jump scare. You know, even though you know it's coming, it's still gets kind of tense, and then when it went off, it wasn't that loud, and then all the gunfire started, and it was like the same volume as the explosion. Everything was the same volume. You know, the explosion was the same volume as the gunshots, was the same volume as the dialogue, whether they were yelling or just talking, and it just really, um, you know, it didn't feel like a war scene. And I know it's not a war movie, so to have like a really big, you know, explosive kind of scene, maybe they thought that would be too much, so they tried to kind of tone it down, but I think that's a mistake. If you're gonna show a war scene, show a war scene. It just it just felt really flat. So that's really the only thing noteworthy within the sound design that I noticed. So overall, I gave the sound a 5.33 out of 10, which is gonna be a C. Uh, nothing really outstanding, nothing awful, pretty much average. The next category in the grid is gonna be acting and casting. Now, every movie has something to celebrate, and with the post, it's definitely gonna come in this category. I thought Meryl Streep's performance was very strong. Obviously, she's Meryl Streep. She's probably never gonna give a weak performance. Um, but that said, there were definitely some scenes where her performance fell into the category of 
Meryl Streep playing a Meryl Streep character rather than Meryl Streep embodying this historical figure. Um, so I thought that was um, a little bit disappointing, you know, but her performance was strong and I mean, she's Meryl Streep, what else can you say, I guess, you know. I did think Tom Hanks' performance is probably one of the stronger in his career, and he's had some very strong performances in his career, so that's not nothing. And the cast of secondary characters was filled with very strong performances as well. You have Alison Brie, you have Sarah Paulson, you have David Cross, you have Zach Woods. I really can't point to a single weak performance within the cast. I did find it a little bit difficult to take Zach Woods seriously. Um, if you don't know who that is, you were probably recognize him as Gabe from The Office. Um, he was also in Silicon Valley. He was in uh, the new Ghostbusters reboot. Um, so he's been in a lot of comedies and he pretty much plays the same character in everything he's in. So it's nice to see him branch out, but I still just in the back of my mind, it was just a little bit difficult to take him seriously. And so I'm a little bit torn on whether or not that's a negative with the casting or a positive because <laughs> I did find it distracting, but I am glad to see him branch out, and I want to see him continue to branch out. And his role was very small in the post. You know, he didn't have a large role. He was only in a few scenes. Um, but that would be one of the potential flaws I found within the acting and the casting. I also was a little bit distracted by David Cross, only because he was nearly unrecognizable. I haven't seen him in much since Arrested Development. He was in The Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, and he had a very full beard, very full beard and and somehow was still more recognizable in that than in this so i'm not quite sure what was going on there but it took me till about halfway through the movie when suddenly i realized who it was but his performance was really strong i did feel that sarah paulson was massively underutilized she really only had one main scene in the movie and it was pretty much just to give a monologue explaining to the audience why meryl streep's character Kay is brave it kind of seems like if your whole movie hinges on, you know, your protagonist having this character trait, you probably shouldn't have to have a two minute speech like two thirds of the way into the movie explaining that character trait to the audience. And that said, I mean, the monologue was very excellently delivered and it was a well written monologue, uh, but it just, you know, it's just a weakness of the script. But anyway, I digress because we're talking about acting and casting. Sarah Paulson was still amazing. I just, I just wish her character had been utilized more um, because she's so talented and she just has such a strong presence. And to have her lost in a movie is, is just wrong. <laughs> so anyway, for the acting and the casting, I gave the category overall a 9.14 out of 10, which is going to be a solid A. So the next category in the grid is going to be directing and cinematography. And I actually wasn't a huge fan of the directing in this movie. There were several very well shot scenes, including some oners, which I am always a sucker for. But there were still some very awkwardly composed shots sprinkled in throughout. Um, there were several Dutch angles inexplicably or extreme high angles looking down on characters. And it was usually just, you know, one, one or two shots sprinkled in a scene here and there. It wasn't like every single scene had them. But it was consistent enough that it was very noticeable and distracting and didn't add to the story at all. And, and I just found that weird and annoying. So I think the most notable scene that has some of these shots, though, and I started to talk about this in the editing, um, is going to be the scene where Kay is on the phone trying to decide if she's going to publish the article. And that scene, like I mentioned before, really tried way too hard to build suspense when we know how the scene is going to end. It was just a lot of cutting back and forth between all the different characters that were on the phone. Every single time you cut back to Meryl Streep, you've got a different angle, including, like I mentioned before, you've got a couple high angles thrown in there, you've got some Dutch angles thrown in there, you've got some slow pushes from across the room, and it just felt like a lot of cheap tricks and you know with a lesser script or a lesser cast I could see relying on those kind of methods or even with a different kind of story where we don't know what's going to happen next sure throw in some weird things to to build that suspense you know and draw the scene out but when we know how the scene is going to end anyway and then on top of that you have actors like Meryl Streep and Tom Hanks who can give incredible performances without relying on all of these visual tricks. It just, it was way too much. And that scene would have been so much stronger if it was about half the length and if we only saw Meryl Streep throughout that entire scene. We hear the other voices talking to her, see her reaction, start from far away, slowly zoom in, 
you know, there's a tight shot on her face, let's, let's publish. We would see her emotions, we would see the internal struggle without all these flashy tricks trying to get us to feel a certain way. And again, I mean, that scene, the audience cheered at the end when she said, yeah, let's publish. Um, so I guess it was effective. I just, I think it could have been so much stronger if he just trusted you know, trusted the script and trusted Streep's performance to get that emotion from the audience instead of relying on all these, uh, you know, camera movements and camera angles and, you know, the quick editing, you know, just eliminate all of that. It's not necessary. You've got Meryl Streep and you've got a good script. Trust it. And those kind of tricks were really, were employed throughout the movie in smaller chunks, but that scene in particular, you know, had the most of it and, and it was the most noticeable. Um, so I'm using that as kind of my example, but it was throughout the movie, there were, there were tricks like that. And it just felt like he didn't trust his actors or his script. And when you're Steven Spielberg and you have Meryl Streep, you have Tom Hanks, you've got a decent script. Yeah, it just felt like he didn't trust his team. So that was kind of my take with the directing and cinematography overall. The lighting was very well done throughout, I'll give it that. And there were definitely some beautiful smoke-filled room, which like the Wonders, I am always a sucker for. So, um, you know, we had some good cinematography, but, but even within the lighting, I mean, overall, it really didn't do anything that spectacular. It just looked pretty average for a highly budgeted Hollywood movie. Um, so that still means that the quality was high. It just didn't go above and beyond to contribute to the mood or the storytelling or anything like that. It just looked nice, you know? And one last quick note about the directing. I really felt like the last scene of the movie where we're introduced to the Watergate scandal, I was really trying way too hard to feel like a Hollywood movie. I mean, it felt like it was trying to set up a sequel, even though I know it was a blatant homage to all the president's men and almost in a way made the post a unofficial prequel to that movie, um, which was just completely unnecessary. And the directing style of the scene just didn't belong with the rest of the movie. The over-the-top, stylized, neo-noir kind of cinematography just didn't match anything we had seen up to that point and felt extremely out of place. So overall for the directing and cinematography, I gave the post a 6.33 out of 10, which is gonna be a B minus. There were definitely some aspects to it that were very high quality and looked really good, but there were still enough flaws and just enough things that I just didn't find visually appealing um, that the score definitely got knocked down and isn't, uh, you know, pushed into that A range at all. So the next two categories, I'm gonna kind of lump into one uh, just because they're pretty similar. And that's gonna be the character aesthetics and the environmental aesthetics. Character aesthetics being hair, makeup, and costumes, and environmental aesthetics being sets, props, and locations. Now with the post, it is a period piece, so it kind of automatically gets a bump in all those categories. Um, and it did do a really good job of portraying, you know, the 1970s and, you know, the particular fashions and cars and, you know, all of those details that you would expect from a big budget Hollywood period piece you've got here. Pretty much within all of those categories, though, it, it very much so felt like you know, I had seen it before in another movie. You know, all of the sets and locations were very beautiful and very well done, but just looked so familiar and just so been there, done that. There was nothing fresh or exciting or, you know, particularly different that other movies hadn't done. So the overall score for both categories is gonna be an eight out of 10, which is gonna be an A minus, still very high quality, still within that A range but I just couldn't give it a perfect in either category and just because of how familiar it felt and, and I just really didn't seem like anything was going above and beyond aside from the fact that it's a period piece because any period piece by its nature has to go above and beyond when it comes to the aesthetics. That's just inherent. All right, now the next category is gonna be impact on film, which I divide up into three subcategories. So we're gonna have the critical impact, the cult impact, and the inspirational impact. Now for new movies, I typically go to Rotten Tomatoes as my main source when it comes to both critical and cult impact. And so for the post, I gave critical impact a 3.5 out of 5. As of the recording of this review, the post has an 88% on Rotten Tomatoes with an average rating of 8 out of 10. So normally I would take those scores and kind of 
convert them and average them together, and I would come up with about a 4 out of 5. But I decided to knock the post down to a 3.5, just because I don't think critics in the future are going to look back on this movie and, and have a whole lot to say about it. But the critics do seem to like it. It is getting good critical reviews um, for whatever that means to you. Similarly, for the cult impact, I gave it a 3 out of 5. As of this recording, it has a 69% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes with an average rating of 3.6 out of 5. So if I kind of convert those and average them out, it would be a 3.5 out of 5. And just like with the critical score, I knocked it down half a point and just gave it a 3 out of 5 um, for the same reason. I don't think people are going to look back in a couple of years and really have much to say or even remember this movie too, too much. For inspirational impact, I gave the post a 2 out of 5. I don't think it's going to be super inspirational in the long term. That said, it is a Meryl Streep movie, it's got Tom Hanks, it's a Steven Spielberg movie. I mean, it's a powerhouse of creative people who historically have inspired future filmmakers. Um, so I couldn't give it zero, and, and even one felt a little bit too low just for, for how many of those kind of people are in this movie. So I went ahead and gave it a two out of five as far as the inspirational impact goes. And also the storyline itself is kind of inherently inspirational, particularly when it comes to you know, the here and now of, of where we are in, in our society and in, in America. Um, so I do think it's going to have a little bit of an inspiration um, just culturally as well. Um, but again, I think that's going to be very short-lived. I don't think it's going to um, continue to inspire people too much longer. So for the total score on Impact Non-Film, those scores are going to average out to a 6.67 out of 10, which is a B-. minus. The last category in the grid is going to be overall enjoyment, and I gave the post a 5 out of 10. Uh, I really didn't love this movie, but I didn't hate it either. And it does have a, a cultural importance for the time being. Um, so I think now is a good time to see it. I think if I ever go back and see this movie, say in five years from now, um, it's probably going to be a three or a four as far as overall enjoyment goes. Um, just because it's, it's not the best movie ever made. It's not awful. It's not a horrendous movie. It has have a lot of things to celebrate, like I mentioned throughout the categories, um, but just overall, um, you know, it's not my cup of tea. So for me personally, I could kind of take it or leave it. You know, I'm glad I saw it because of the cultural relevance. I really don't think I'm ever gonna revisit it and see it again. I did give the post two points of extra credit. The first point is gonna be for that cultural relevance. The scores for both genre and writing were definitely bogged down just because of the, the heavy-handed nature of the, the delivery of the cultural relevance. But I do think it's important to see movies that touch on the world around us and the issues that are important. And freedom of the press and transparency within government are both issues that are very prominent right now. Um, so I do think this movie is worth seeing just because of, the, of that cultural relevance even though that same cultural relevance kind of bogs down the quality of the movie as a whole, particularly within the writing. Um, and, and I think that that cultural relevancy uh, is going to make this movie irrelevant in time. Um, but for right now, I, I thought it was worth giving it a point of extra credit, um, particularly since other categories were, were lowered because of it. Um, but it's something worth noting. I also gave it a point of extra credit for inciting interest in history. Pretty much any movie that can do that um, is worth celebrating for that reason, even if it's not the best movie in the world. Um, you know, if you can walk away from a movie and say, you know, oh, I want to go learn more about this now, that's something. So I did give it an extra credit point for that as well. So the overall score for the post is going to be a 67.27, which is a solid B in my book since I consider a 50 to be average. It's definitely a movie I would recommend because of the cultural relevancy, and if you like Meryl Streep or Tom Hanks, definitely go see it. You know, it's not something I'm going to say it's not worth seeing. Um, that said, it's definitely not the best movie of 2017, and the fact that it is most likely going to get nominated in that category for the Academy Awards kind of irritates me because there were so many good movies that came out in 2017, and this was just not the best, not even top 10, um, but it's going to be bulked in there. So that's really all I have to say about the post. I hope you enjoyed this review, and I'll see you next time. Hey, thanks for watching. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and if you liked what you saw, don't forget to subscribe to Gritty Films on YouTube by pressing this button. Also, like and share this video. You can follow Gritty Films on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram for new video announcements, entertainment news, fun pics, and more. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.